Good evening and a very, very warm welcome to our service tonight. It's so good to see you here as we gather in the name of our risen Saviour, Jesus Christ. Uh, it's so nice to welcome visitors. We pray that you'd be encouraged and blessed as we gather here. And it's also great to welcome those of you who are joining us online. We pray that for all of us, uh, we'd be refreshed, um, encouraged, challenged, uh, and prepared for the week ahead as we seek to serve Jesus in our community together. Uh, just uh, one small thing I want to highlight uh, from the notices. Uh, next week uh, in the afternoon, uh, we're hoping to have a, a small outreach event uh, at Dalmore Beach. Uh, and there's information about that uh, on the, uh, the email that went out. Um, but I just want to encourage you and ask you to pray for that. Um, it's uh, so important for us to look uh, and think about opportunities to share the gospel with people. Uh, and one of the great opportunities that we have in the summer is that uh, we, we can connect with people, um, both local in the village uh, and also people who are visiting uh, us from away. Uh, and we want to take advantage of the opportunity uh, just to share some gospel materials with them uh, and to show them that uh, we've got a wonderful message that we want to, uh, to offer them. Uh, and so please pray for that uh, in the week ahead um, for all the different things, uh, I suppose maybe more one of the most important. Most important is to pray for conversion. Second most important is to pray for weather. Um, and so if we can just keep that in mind as we pray uh, in the week ahead, that would be wonderful. We come to God this evening because he's calling us into his presence. And our call to worship, uh, which opens our service, is taken from Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And it's with joy and thanksgiving that we begin our service. Our opening uh, singing is going to be taken from Psalm 145, and this is actually the psalm that we're going to be looking at together uh, this evening. Uh, I want us to start by singing uh, a section from the middle, and we're going to be singing from the Scottish Psalter version, uh, and the second version that appears uh, therein. So that's page 444, um, but the words are also on the screen. As I said this morning, my apologies that that screen's not working. I broke a cable yesterday, but all being well, it'll be up and running again uh, next week. Uh, these words speak uh, of God's goodness to us, to the whole world, and we add our voices to the millions around the world today as we praise God for everything that he's done for us. Alistair will lead us and we'll stand to sing together. Thank 
Let's pray together. Dear God, our Father in heaven, we are so thankful that we can come to worship you this evening. And as we do so, we come as those who are hungry and thirsty for you. We are aware that, that, that you are the single most important thing in our lives. You are the one that we need more than anything else. And um, you're not just our creator um, from whom we come um, originally, you are our sustainer every single day. And we acknowledge that, that, that at every moment we need you. And we confess that all too often we forget about you. We're so sorry for that. But we come just this evening with a renewed sense of our, our dependence on you, the fact that we owe you everything and that without you we can do nothing. And so we come this evening so aware of our need of you. We come hungry and thirsty for you, praying, Father, that you'd pour your blessing out upon us, that in our midst this evening, you would be at work, that, that your Holy Spirit would, would be moving within us and among us in power, that for all of us, our, our ears would be open, that, that our minds would have understanding and that we'd see more of your beauty and glory and majesty revealed in Jesus Christ. And so bless us, we pray. Please may your hand be upon us and every single one of us here. We pray, Father, that you would just draw near to us all, that we'd hear your voice speaking to us, that you'd be our strength and our guide in everything that we do. And for any of us here coming with particular needs, we do so um, uh, just longing and ready to lay them before you, praying that you would meet with us and speak to us and help us to hear your voice. We pray, Father, that um, as we spend time singing and praying and reading your word together, that our souls would be fed and nourished, that our minds would be sharpened, and that in every part of our being, we would be prepared and equipped so that we can live for you um, in the week ahead. We want to give you this week of our lives, and we pray, Father, that in everything that we do, we would be serving you. Even if we're not even realizing it, we pray that you would use us for your glory. So thank you so much that we can gather here and please bless us and bless all those who are meeting in your name. We rejoice that we're part of a worldwide church. We, we, we rejoice uh, that there is only one church, one body, one family united to you through your son, our Lord Jesus. And so we come to you in his name. We rejoice before you in his name and we pray to you in his name. Amen. Now, each week in our evening services, we take an opportunity to think about something related to the life of our church or something that will help and encourage you in your lives as Christians. We call that Sul Er, uh, and it means uh, to have a look at. Uh, and so we're going to have, a, every week we have a look at something that uh, is, is of help to us. Uh, this week, we're going to be thinking about the ETS Saturday course. Uh, for those of you who are maybe not familiar with this, uh, every year, uh, ETS, uh, our, our seminary in Edinburgh, runs what's called the Saturday course. Uh, and this course runs, meets once a month on a Saturday, and three lecturers speak about various topics. It's been running for about 20 years, and it's been something that's been a massive blessing uh, to lots and lots of different people over the years. Uh, this year, uh, there are going to be three, uh, the, as I said, well, there's always three lectures. This year, the three lecturers uh, are going to be Andy Hunter, Alec MacDonald, and Corey Brock. Now, Andy Hunter uh, is uh, a director with the FIEC. The FIEC is the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches. Um, and so that's uh, churches uh, that are, uh, well, there will be Baptist churches, independent churches scattered all across Scotland, um, who uh, share so much of what we believe uh, in terms of, of theology. Uh, and Andy's been closely involved with ETS and with the Free Church uh, through lots of different partnerships over the years. And Andy's going to be speaking all about pastoral care. And I think that's a really 
a really wonderful topic to look at because it's very easy to think that pastoral care is just the job of ministers and elders, um, but really pastoral care is the job of the whole, um, the whole congregation. And so it's really good to think through how uh, we can all support one another in terms of offering pastoral care. Um, the second speaker is Alec MacDonald. I don't know if we've got the slide because there's a picture of them on the slide, I think. Uh, the, second picture, uh, the second speaker is Alec MacDonald, who many of you will know. Uh, he was minister in Bishop Briggs, then in Aberdeen, uh, then uh, in Edinburgh. Uh, and he's been here several times over the years. And he's going to be looking at, um, at people that Jesus met. And so his topic will be uh, um, uh, in the category of biblical studies. And it'd be a great opportunity to look at um, uh, the people that Jesus met and the lessons that we learn from his interactions with them. And then the last speaker is Corey Brock. Uh, Corey is the new assistant um, at St. Columbus Free Church uh, in Edinburgh, uh, a dramatic improvement on the last one. Uh, and he's, um, he's going to be lecturing on um, really the big story of the gospel. And in particular, he's, he's going to be thinking about creation and recreation. The fact that in the future, God's plans um, are not just to save our souls, but to save our souls, our bodies, our world, indeed the whole universe. And it's that great message of restoration uh, that, uh, that Corey is going to be lecturing on. And so I just want to really recommend this course to you. Some of you I know have done the Saturday course. Um, uh, and, and I know that you've benefited from it immensely. If you've never done it before, please just think about it. Um, it's not something that you have to be, it, it's, it's completely, uh, there's no qualifications, it's, it's not in any way assuming that you're, you know, that you've have had any previous study or anything like that. It's just, uh, it's open to absolutely everyone. Now, a couple of practicalities to go through just so that you're aware. Uh, there's two ways you can do the course. One is you can just go to the course and just listen. And that's absolutely fine. If you want to just go and listen, that's perfect. Um, it's also cheaper if you want to do it that way. Um, but if you want to actually get the qualification to get the certificate uh, or eventually the diploma uh, in theological studies, then there's actually essays that you can write. Now, you might all think, oh, no way. Well, I want you to think about it because... Um, Writing an essay is not that hard, really, and it's a great way to, to dig in and study a little bit more about a topic. Uh, and it's not, the markers aren't harsh, it's not scary or anything like that. Um, it's something that's, that's very, you know, it's just, it's just very much open to everyone. It's once a month, it's on a Saturday. In Stornoway, there's a group that meets where you can watch it live, but if you can't make it every Saturday, you can actually watch them all back online. So even, you know, if you think, oh, well, I could do some Saturdays, but not all of them, you can actually go and catch up online as well. So I hope that I've removed all excuses um, that you may have thought of regarding this course. Um, and I hope you'll have a wee think about it because it's a wonderful opportunity. If you go to the ETS website, so ets.ac.uk, uh, you'll see that under, uh, I think, courses, let me see, I can't read that one, it's too far away. Um, yeah, courses, you'll see the Saturday course down in the middle there, um, under open courses. That's it, down there, you click on that, then you scroll down, and you've got all the information there. On the right-hand side, you've got loads of further information, and then there's the button that you're all going to click that says, register now. Okay, that's the Saturday course. Um, it starts, I think, middle of September sometime. The dates are all on the website there. Okay, let's turn and read God's word together now. And our reading is going to be from Psalm 145. This is the psalm we sung at the start, and we're going to read it together now in full, and we're going to spend a wee bit of time thinking about some of what it teaches uh, later on. Psalm 145, please turn to it in your Bibles or on your phone, or if you prefer, you can follow on the screens. Psalm 145, a song of praise of David. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty 
and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak, of the pra- speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Amen. This is God's word and may he bless it to us. Let's pray together again. Father, we acknowledge that you are God and King over all creation. And uh, we thank you that that means that we can come to you um, with prayers that extend right to the ends of the earth. We want to pray for uh, nations of the world um, where there's suffering and strife and difficulty. We think um, again of all the unrest in Ukraine um, and just the tensions there and in Russia um, and all that's going on there. We pray, Father, for healing. We pray for peace. We pray for a de-escalation of the conflict there, and we pray for everybody who's caught up in the midst of what's going on. Um, We pray for other nations in the world, nations that uh, suffer with poverty, with drought, um, with disease, ones that, diseases that that we have easy access to medicine, but yet for them can be devastating. Uh, We pray for nations where there's political unrest, and where there's tension and fear. Uh, We pray, Father, that in all these circumstances, um, the hope of the gospel would transform individuals, families, communities, and indeed whole nations. We want to pray for our own nation here. We pray, Father, for for our governments in London and Edinburgh. Uh, We especially pray that you would uh, guide and direct the, the, the appointment of a new prime minister, and for whoever that will be, we pray that they would seek you and be guided by you. We pray for all those involved in, in the life of our nation. We think of people involved in civil service, um, in schools and education, those in the health service, in the media, uh, in all the different things that keep uh, our nation um, functioning. We think of those in the armed forces, and we pray for them all. We thank you for um, the blessings and provisions that we enjoy every day. We pray for our own island and we pray, Father, that you'd be at work among us. And um, we're so aware that, that, that we're now living in a mission field, a huge mission field, where the majority of people don't come to church and don't, don't know you. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to be a light in that in that darkness. And we pray that for every one of us, you would take us and use us to share the good news of Jesus this week uh, and in, in the rest of our lives. Please be at work among us. Please bring people to faith in Jesus. Um, we think of uh, just, just the huge gaps that we see in our churches. Um, we, see, um, we see huge age groups that are barely, barely present. Um, Adults my age and 
um, young adults and children. And we pray, Father, that you would be drawing them in and help us, help us to, to reach out in a way that will, will meaningfully connect with them. And please, please be at work among us. Please have mercy on our island. And please help those who are in particular need just now. We pray for those who struggle with addiction, um, for those whose lives are in the grip of um, just that awful slavery. We pray for them um, and ask that they would find freedom and healing um, through you. We pray for those who face serious illness. We ask that you would just draw so near to them and to their families, all those who are facing just uncertainty and um, and fear about their health over coming weeks and months. And we pray for those who mourn, asking that you would bring comfort and peace to, to all those who've lost loved ones in recent times, that they would just be strengthened by you. We also want to pray for those who are busy, those who are under pressure, um, and who are worn out by all the, the responsibilities that life can bring. We pray, Father, that you would just bring, bring peace and refreshment to them. We pray for families where there have maybe been fallouts and difficulties. We pray for um, the restoration of broken relationships. Uh, we pray for healing uh, where there has been hurt. And we also just want to pray particularly for um, people who we know of who um, perhaps feel like they can just never come to church, either that they don't belong or that they are not welcome or that they don't fit in or, or because they've been hurt in the past, whatever it may be, we pray, Father, for, for healing and we pray that you would draw people back to come and hear the amazing good news of Jesus. And so we've got so many needs to bring before you, we just lay them before you and we do that because we know that you are big enough to carry all of these, that you are the one that we can turn to um, with all of our needs. And so we pray, Father, that you would just pour your grace and mercy out upon us anew and that you would be doing great things in our midst. We come to you because we are hungry for you and because we desperately need you. So bless us and have mercy on us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to uh, sing again together um, from Psalm 25 and we're going to sing the Sing Psalms version um, after we sing this psalm, we'll turn back to Psalm 145, but uh, this psalm uh, is, is a wonderful prayer for us to pray as we go into a new week. Um, we are praying that God would reveal his ways to us, that he would be our guide, um, that all day, every day, our hope would be in him, that we'd follow him and serve him. Uh, and so we're going to stand and sing verses four to nine uh, uh, together, and Alistair will lead us again. O oh Lord, reveal to me your ways and all your paths help me. Because the Lord is just 
just and good. He shows his paths to all who stray. He guides the meek in what is right and teaches them his holy Well, this evening, I'd like us to turn back to Psalm 145, and I'd like us to read the first two verses again. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day, I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Tonight, I want us to do something that's maybe a wee bit different. Um, and I hope you'll see uh, as we go through why it is a wee, di wee bit different. Our title is An Ordinary Day in the Life of a Christian. Uh, and I want us just to think about an ordinary day. Now, for all of us, an ordinary day will look slightly different. Um, if, you imagine, um, if you imagine the, the, the day uh, that lies ahead tomorrow or later in the week, we'll all have different plans, different things that we're going to be doing, different experiences. But the fact that we all have our own different ordinaries, um, there's certain general things that on an ordinary day are going to be the same for us all. And these are the things I want to think about today. Um, I'm going to list seven. Seven things that happen on an ordinary day. Number one, you wake up. So tomorrow is going to be yet another Monday morning, very likely to be yet another ordinary day. Tomorrow we're all going to have duties. So maybe that's work, maybe school, maybe responsibilities at home, maybe people that you'll attend to, even if it's just by phoning them or meeting them. Uh, maybe you'll have an appointment you have to go to. Maybe you'll have a medicine that you have to take. Maybe you've got a dog that you have to walk. Tomorrow, we will all interact with people. So there's family that we live with, friends whose company we enjoy, colleagues you'll work alongside or classmates, strangers that you'll encounter um, as you go through your day, maybe even enemies, people who are difficult, people who will be frustrating, maybe even people uh, who will hurt you. Tomorrow, we will all receive news um, that might be national headlines. Um, it might just be simp simply asking somebody, how are you doing? Tomorrow we will have successes. So there'll be things that go well, things that we accomplish, um, things that are a joy and a delight. Uh, tomorrow there will be sufferings, things that, that are either done by us or done to us that will cause pain, sorrow, and disappointment. Now, that might be as minor as your football team losing. It might be as major as a health scare uh, or a crisis at work. Uh, so one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven, we will go to bed. And that's an ordinary day. Now, there's exceptional days when one or, one or more of these things won't happen. But if tomorrow is an ordinary day, then I think that we'd be pretty, we can be pretty confident that we can experience all seven of these. What I want us to ask tonight is, what difference does the gospel make to an ordinary day? And I think that's an incredibly important thing for us to think about. Psalm, uh, Psalm 145 uh, speaks in verse 2 of, of every day, blessing the Lord. But even though Psalm 145 speaks of doing that every day, I think it's very easy for us um, in our discipleship, in our lives as Christians, to focus primarily on exceptional days. 
So there might be days when we experience wonderful things, answered prayer, encouragement, wonderful awareness of God being near us. And, and these exceptional days, if we ever have them, are what we tend to hold on to. And even in our weekly pattern of worship as a church, it's, it's easy to kind of think that, you know, our, our Christian discipleship is very much concentrated on meeting together on a Sunday to worship, meeting together midweek uh, to pray and to have Bible study. All of that is, is not necessarily bad. All of it's good. Exceptional days are great. And the high point of, of worshiping on the first day of the week is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But all of it carries the risk that an, on an ordinary day, on, on a boring Monday morning, we can fall into the mindset where God can seem in the background and the gospel can easily lie to one side. And what I hope we're going to see tonight is that right in the midst of the most ordinary of days, you will find the extraordinary wonder of the gospel in it all. So we're going to go through uh, each of these in turn. On an ordinary day then, you're going to wake up so alarm goes off, you get out of bed, you get dressed, you have breakfast, you plod on into another ordinary day. And all of that's very basic. It's all just the stuff that we do before the main activities of the day begin. But if we stop and think for a moment, we discover that, that before you've even finished your cornflakes or your cup of tea, you have already experienced a feast of theology. If you go back to the beginning of the Bible and read Genesis 1, uh, you'll see that three of the biggest theological truths contained in the Bible are revealed on the very first page. The first is the doctrine of creation. That's, that's obvious. Um, it's, it's one of the first things that the Bible um, reveals to us. Um, opening sentence, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's telling us that God is our creator and that everything around us is the work of his hands, or well, maybe more strictly speaking, the work of his voice. He calls it into being. Through his son, Jesus Christ, the world is created. Second big truth revealed on page one is the doctrine of providence. Um, so God doesn't just create the world and leave it, um, that's a, 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 a kind of religious position that's been held over the centuries. It's often known as deism, the idea that God created the world and then he just left it to its own devices. That's not the biblical picture at all. Um, the Bible tells us very clearly that God is involved in his creation. He upholds, directs, disposes, governs all of his creatures and all of their actions. And that balance, order, and functioning of the universe that we can observe around us is all maintained by God. And then the third big thing that's revealed on page one of the Bible is what we call the cultural mandate. Now, you won't find those words uh, in Genesis 1, um, but you will find the concept. Um, this is um, the term that theologians use to describe the command that was given to humanity to be fruitful and to multiply and uh, to fill the earth and to subdue it. And so um, the phrase here, cultural mandate, comes from the idea that humanity is to cultivate life on earth. And so humanity is to cultivate community, industry, art, discovery, education. In other words, humanity is meant to thrive in the wonderful creation that God has given to it. And what I want us to discover uh, is that all three of these saturate the first half an hour of every ordinary day. And so when you open your eyes, when you take a breath, which, well, you've done all night anyway, um, when you stand up, when you get dressed, when you wash, when you plan, all of these things are displaying uh, creation, providence, in the, and the cultural mandate. In fact, all three of these are in the bowl of cornflakes that you eat for breakfast. Now, 
maybe you don't eat cornflakes, I just want you to imagine that you do. You look at that bowl of cornflakes or whatever it is you eat for breakfast, what are you looking at? What are you looking at when you look at a bowl of cornflakes? You're looking at seed time and harvest. You're looking at the turning of the seasons. You're looking at the provision of warm sunshine and hydrating rainfall. You're seeing craftsmanship in the process used to make the cornflakes and to make the box that they came in. You're seeing employment, purpose, achievement. You're seeing provision and nourishment. You're seeing an orderly society of commerce and trade. And you are seeing delight if, like me, you absolutely love cornflakes. And it's reminding us that, that there's so much just in your cornflakes, just in what you have for breakfast. And you can say exactly the same thing about your clothes, about your homes, about your phone, about everything that you encounter when you wake up in a new day. And all of it is pointing us back to God. And Psalm 145 makes that clear. The Lord is good to all. His mercy is over all that he has made. So, What do you need to do to grow in theological knowledge? Do you need to read books? Do you need to listen to sermons and podcasts? Do you need to do the Saturday course? Do you need to have in-depth discussions? Well, these things are all good. Yes, you can do all of these things. But you also just need to eat your cornflakes with your eyes open. It's very easy for an ordinary day to begin with a sigh. And I've done that many times, especially on a Monday. But for us as Christians, an ordinary day should begin with a wow. Number two, on an ordinary day, you will have duties that you need to do. Some of these might be a source of pleasure, so maybe you love school, maybe uh, you're delighted to go to work, maybe you really enjoy gardening, or taking the dog for a walk. So maybe all these things give you a huge source of pleasure. But maybe, maybe the duties you have are a source of pressure. So school might be rubbish. Work might be stressful. The garden might be relentless and the dog might be driving you around the bend. Sometimes pleasure, sometimes pressure. And the truth is, the duties of an ordinary day are, are, are almost always a mixture of both. What difference does the gospel make to that? Well, the amazing thing about the gospel is that the focus is neither on pleasure nor on pressure. The focus is on purpose. And again, it's theology that tells you this. The doctrine of creation, the doctrine of providence, the cultural mandate, all of that is telling you that you are made for a purpose, that what you do matters. And even on the most ordinary of days, your life is part of something bigger. And Psalm 145 hints towards this um, in verse 4. It says, um, it says, one generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Now you might think, oh well yeah, that's a great verse for ministers like me, you know, you're proclaiming God's mighty acts to a congregation, to a community, and I'm doing that in my generation, and there's people who've come before me, people who come after me. But I think that the scope of this verse is much, much wider than just the work of ministers, because the whole of human history is grounded on an inescapable dependence of one generation on the next. Every generation depends on the one that came before it, and the one that comes after it depends on them. That applies to everything. It applies biologically, it applies materially, it applies educationally, it applies technologically, uh, socially, culturally, and most importantly of all, it applies theologically. You are part of a generation that's totally reliant on those who came before you, and it is on you and me that the next generation completely depends. And this verse, verse four, I think is fascinating because it's a verse that every human is fulfilling even if they don't know it. 
So you think about the genius researchers um, at the universities across our country uh, who are teaching students. They are commending God's works to the next generation. If, if you have a, a genius uh, medical researcher looking at molecular biology or whatever it is they do, um, what are they doing? They're just commending God's works to the next generation because all their research is teaching them more and more about what God has made it's the same for somebody who teaches you music at school. Um, they are, are, are passing on a skill and a gift from one generation to the next. So is the crofter teaching his young sheepdog. So is the gardener planting a tree. So is the civil servant allocating money to the education budget. It all ties in together. No duty, no matter how ordinary, lies outside God's mighty works. Now, this is incredibly important for us to recognize when we think about duty because it'll help us to shift our mindset from viewing duties as obligations and instead recognizing them as opportunities. So often, the stuff that we've got to do every week feel like obligations, and there's a sense in which they are. But, but the gospel is telling us that Every ordinary day is an incredible opportunity to fulfill the purposes that God has for us. Now, there's two very important points related to this that I want to just mention uh, in turn. One is that when we talk about this whole idea of purpose, it's very important that we mustn't be too individualistic. This is a huge danger that we face in our culture just now because everything is, well, virtually everything is individualistic. And so when we talk about purpose, we think in terms of personal goals, uh, personal hopes, personal dreams. And that's not wrong um, as long as it, these things don't lead us uh, into sin. But an, individual, an individualistic understanding of purpose is poor theology because God's plans are always for us all. God functions collectively. His plans are for us all together as part of his creation. And that's why some days, your days will be ordinary because we're all having sometimes just a small part to play. But the key thing we need to recognize is that the contribution that you make to this generation, the contribution that you're gonna to make to the generation around us this week is not determined by its size or by its prominence. It's determined by what God can do with it. And I think that's something that's so important for us to remember. Um, we so often think that if we're gonna be any use to God, we've gotta do big stuff. Well, God's, God is an expert at using little things. Sometimes things that are so little, we're not even aware that we're being used. Jesus made this so clear when he told us that every cup of water counts. Every cup of water counts. Life as a Christian is not about being someone big. It's about being part of something bigger. So we mustn't be individualistic um, in, in terms of what we think about purpose. It's something that we do together. This raises a second point, though, um, that's also really important. When we think about duties, opportunities, purpose, it's really important that we mustn't be wasteful. Now, I'm a wee bit hesitant to say this because um, I think it's highly likely that I'm going to make you all feel guilty, and I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I don't want to make, uh, I don't want to make people feel guilty, but... Um, uh, we do have to recognize that it's easy to think that an ordinary day hasn't got much to offer. So it's easy to think, well, what have I got to offer for Jesus this week? And it's very easy to come to the conclusion very quickly, well, not very much, because it's just an ordinary week. And as a consequence of that, um, you know, we can waste the time that we have. So much so, sometimes I hear people say, you know, over the years, I've heard people say, you know, what are you up to? Ugh, I'm just passing the time. And I remember once a Christian I knew many, many years ago, um, and he was at his happiest when he could just find something to pass the time. It was almost as though time was an enemy. And the more he could just make it pass away as quickly as possible, the better. And 
I can understand that mindset, but I hope we can all see that that mindset's tragic. And it's a travesty of everything that this psalm speaks of. You look at verse two, uh, you know, does it say, um, each day I rise, I'll pass the time away? No. Each day I will bless the Lord. Each day I'll praise him and I'll live for him. Each day is an incredible opportunity to serve him. Now, I'm going to say one more thing that risks being even more offensive. That there's a category of people who are in most danger of falling into this trap. And that category of people is the retired. People who are retired. And what I want to say is this. When you're retired, it's so easy to think that because you can't do as much, therefore you can't do anything. That is absolutely not true. Absolutely not true. In fact, being retired opens up a whole host of opportunities that you will never have had time for while you were working. And I want you to think about that. Think about how even just a, a text to somebody, a conversation, meeting with someone for a coffee, going for a walk with them, sending someone a card, whatever it may be, you have no idea how much God can use that to bless someone. And so, um, so those of you who are retired, we need an army of retired people who are living every day um, seizing the opportunities that God gives to them. But whatever our age, whatever our stage, ordinary daily duties are an amazing opportunity for God to fulfill his purposes. Number three, on an ordinary day, you are going to encounter people. And so that's family, friends, colleagues, classmates, strangers, and even if you're on your own all day, the, the loneliness that you may feel is still connected to other people because it's their absence that's giving you that sense of isolation. So for some of us, when we wake up, the very first thing we might see is somebody else. For others, um, the very first thing that we'll see is a gap that we desperately wish wasn't empty. It's just one thing I want to say here. Um, earlier on, uh, we asked that um, long-standing classic theological question, um, what are you looking at when you see a bowl of cornflakes? Um, now we're going to ask an even more important um, question. When you meet people, what are you looking at? And the fundamental truth of the gospel is that every time you look at another human, you are seeing the image of God. That's what makes humanity so incredibly special. That's what makes each person unique, precious. They're an image bearer. And that's also what makes sin so awful because the image bearer that you're looking at, whether that's when you're looking at someone else or looking at yourself in the mirror, has been broken by sin. Their relationship with God has been ruined. We're all prone to rebellion against him. And for any who are not yet believers, they're in monumental eternal danger. That is what you see every time you look at someone. That's why your family and friends can give you such delight. Their warmth, their love, care is a magnificent declaration of God's mighty works and of his abundant kindness. That's why you and your colleagues can achieve amazing things at work this week. That's why meeting somebody for the first time is wonderful because you're getting to know more of God's handiwork. But perhaps it's most important of all for us to remember this when people are difficult, when people frustrate us, when people hurt us. The person who lets you down does so as an image bearer. Now that makes their sin all the more awful. That's why sin is so serious because we sin as image bearers. We take the image that God has given us and we turn it back on him and we use it to rebel against him and shake our fist at him. But it also makes our reaction to people crucial. 
Because if we respond by being harsh and aggressive and spiteful and cruel, then we need to remember that we are doing that to the image of God. And this is where, well here and everywhere, Jesus is our example. And he's an example to us because he was always ruthless with sin and gracious with sinners. And that's exactly how we need to be as well. Every single person that you're going to meet on an ordinary day, at home, at school, at work, in Tesco, in another car, on the TV, whoever and wherever they are, they're made in the image of God. They're tragically broken by sin. They're desperately need, in need of Jesus. And if that never crosses our minds, then we are getting our theological basics completely wrong. On an ordinary day, you're going to receive news. That can happen in thousands of ways. Checking the headlines on your phone, uh, getting a phone call and a message from someone, opening your emails, uh, asking someone um, how they're getting on. It's all just feeding us news. Even the most ordinary of days will involve us receiving and processing an enormous amount of information. Some of that news will be true, some of it will be false, some of it will be healthy, some of it will be harmful. Earlier, we were asking the question, you know, what are you looking at, whether that's conflicts or people or whatever. Here, the key question is, what are you looking with? In other words, as you receive news, what lens is that coming through? Because whenever you look at something, you need to have the appropriate lens, whether it's sunglasses on a bright day, um, you can just imagine, you can use your imagination to try and uh, experience what that would be like. Um, A microscope to see something tiny, a telescope to see something far away. If you want to see clearly, you need to look through the correct lens. The key point that for us as Christians, the gospel is the lens through which we must view everything. Everything. So news of political unrest among the nations, we remember that God is sovereign, that his kingdom is is an everlasting kingdom, his dominion endures to all generations. Anxious about news of economic hardship ahead, which is probably going to be a reality for for most of us, the gospel tells us that God will provide. He's the one who gives us food in due season. News of people being mistreated in the world and suffering, the gospel tells us that all injustice is wrong, it's going to be called to account, Uh, the unrepentant wicked will be destroyed. All the information we receive needs to be viewed through the lens of the gospel. And this is why we mustn't just have our gospel glasses on on a Sunday. We need to have them on all the time, through every ordinary day. And the key point is that, that, that looking through the lens of the gospel is not, it's not trying to give you religious vision it's going to give you accurate vision. The lens of the gospel is going to show you on every ordinary day that people are precious, that life has meaning, that time is short, that gossip is damaging, that gentleness is strength, that injustice is wrong, that kindness is valuable, that riches are overrated, that sex won't satisfy you, that life is a wonderful gift, and that there is always, always, always hope for you and for every person that you meet. I'm going to do number five and six together. On an ordinary day, you're going to succeed and you're going to suffer. That might be big uh, or small. It might be a day when everything goes well. It might be a day full of frustrations. The gospel makes a massive difference to all of these, and it does so in all directions. So our moments of success are reasons to rejoice, reasons to sing the words of verse 1, I extol you, my God and King. I bless your name forever and ever, as we enjoy all the good things that he gives us in life. Our moments of suffering are reasons to sorrow, reasons to cling on to verse 14, the promise that the Lord upholds those who are falling. In moments of success, the gospel lifts us to rejoice. In moments of suffering, the gospel reaches us when we're low. But what I want us to see is that the gospel does even more than that. The gospel guards us against thinking that life should always be wonderful. 
It's so easy to make an idol of our success or of uh, our comforts or to long for approval from others or power and influence in our lives and to think that these are the keys to happiness and that these are a sign of God's favor when they're not. The gospel guards us from thinking that, you know, everything must always be perfect for me. The gospel tells us that that's not how life is going to be. But the gospel also guards us against thinking that suffering is always awful. That's so easy to kind of have that very simplistic view of life where, you know, if things are good, then it's great, and if things are bad, then it's awful. I want more good, and I never want things to be bad. But the truth is, struggle and suffering and trials can be an enormous source of good. And they're a key tool in God's hands in his work of sanctification as he teaches us guides us, and when he needs to, he disciplines us so that we become more and more like Jesus. Paul speaks of that so powerfully. He says that we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. On an ordinary day this week, when you have success, rejoice and thank God. But guard your heart so that your hope and identity is always in Jesus and not in whether or not you have a good day. And when you face sufferings, never think that it means that God has abandoned you. He's never going to leave you. And the fact that you're suffering is not a sign that he's forgotten you. It's a sign that he's got big plans for you. As we saw in verse 14, he upholds those who are falling and he raises up all who are bowed down. So on an ordinary day, we're going to get up, we're going to attend to duties, we're going to encounter people, we're going to receive news, we're going to have successes, we're going to have sufferings, and then you're all going to go to bed. And as Christians, we can and should do three things when we go to bed. First, we can look back over the day that we've had. And as we do so, we give thanks to God for everything that we've received from him. We think about all that we've learned. We acknowledge where we've gone wrong and we repent and tell God how sorry we are. And we marvel at how God transforms every single part of the most ordinary days. The fact that that God is righteous in all his ways, kind in all his works. So we look back. Second thing you can do is look round. Sometimes that will be with a sense of peace. You get into bed, you look around, you think, oh, I'm so glad I'm in bed. I'm so glad I can rest. And there's just that great sense of peace and relief Uh, of getting to bed. Sometimes going to bed is just the best. But sometimes you look around with a sense of fear. Sometimes going to bed is the worst and it's the last place you want to go and you go and you're just confronted with all your worries and thoughts and fears and struggles. The amazing thing is that when you lie in bed, you can look around knowing that God is with you, that the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. This is maybe a guess, I probably shouldn't be so speculative, um, but I would, I would like to think that, that the majority of times that that verse has been fulfilled has been when people have been lying in bed. Lying in bed at night, struggling to sleep, anxious, suffering, lonely, and you talk to God, and he is near to you, near to all who call upon him. So you can look back, you can look around, but most of all, as we go to bed, we can look forward. We can look forward to another amazing ordinary day tomorrow. And even more so, we can look forward to an utterly amazing eternity with Jesus and with each other in the new creation. And I love the way this is brought before us in verse 2. I love the way verse 2 starts with every day, and it ends with forever and ever. And that's the great wonder of the gospel. It transforms every day through all that God has done for us in Jesus. And it holds incredible promises 
for our future, it promises the most wonderful forever and ever for all. I want you to go away now and I want you to think about a final question. What are you going to do with all of this tomorrow morning? For those of you who are Christians, how is this going to change tomorrow? How is it going to shape how you get out of bed? How is it going to affect the way you live your life? Um, how is it going to shift your perspective? What are you going to do with this tomorrow morning? Um, both in terms of you know, the opportunities that you have and also the struggles that you face. But even more importantly, for anyone here or anyone watching at home who's not yet a Christian, what are you going to do with all of this tomorrow? What are you going to do with it? Because you've got to do something. You've got to either say, no thanks, or say, yes, Lord, I want to follow you. I want every ordinary day that I've got left to be for you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word and for the truth that you've revealed to us in it and for the difference that makes to every single part of our lives and to every day that we live. We thank you for all the blessings that you give to us on every ordinary day of our lives. We pray that, that every ordinary day that we have this week and, and that we have in the rest of our lives would be transformed um, by the gospel and that we would see and recognize the difference that you make to every part of our lives that you would take us and use us so that we would live every do ordinary day of our lives for your glory amen we're going to close with psalm 116 and the sing psalms version uh, from one uh, to nine uh, these I love these verses and I love how they begin. They speak um, of just of how they're just a great expression of our love to God. But I also love how they end because in verse nine it speaks of uh, living for him while we have breath. So it's simultaneously praising God for what he's done for us and it's recommitting our lives to him as we seek to serve him. And so it's a brilliant psalm for us to finish with and it's a brilliant psalm to, to set us up for the week that lies ahead. Let's stand and sing together. I love the Lord because He heard my
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and all God's people say, Amen. Thank you so much for being with us uh, this evening. Uh, there's tea and coffee served from the table at the side there as, as usual, so we'd be delighted if you're able to stay. Uh, it would be lovely to get the chance uh, to chat together. I hope you all uh, have a wonderful week, uh, and in all the ordinary days that lie ahead, may you know uh, the extraordinary joy and peace.